I did a previous video about fiber, in particular about single mode fiber and multi mode fiber uh, and the use of that in a home lab. And today we're going to do a little walk around of how I pulled fiber when building this house. And so there are some good lessons about things that I did both right and things I did wrong. The goal of pulling the fiber in the house was to have high speed connectivity between a number of locations. There were a few um, wiring closets, the server room, the office, and a few AV locations that I wanted to have high bandwidth capability over fiber. And another consideration was that during construction, you can pull wire to a bunch of locations. And there's always some risk of wire getting damaged. And with fiber, it's a little higher because it's easy to damage it just by having bins. Uh, and so there are a couple things that I did in that sort of re reduction of that happening. And one was that almost all the locations have more than one fiber pulled from more than one path. So as an example, the two primary wiring closets each have two paths out of those rooms that make their way back down to the server room in as, as different as paths as possible. And so when I was doing the wire layout where I sort of mapped how I was going to get wire from one part of the house to another, I was pretty careful to try to keep those paths as separate as possible so that a single incident would only affect one of those two paths. And there are lots of things that can happen. I think when putting up drywall, the most common thing is drywall screws going off a little bit um, and hitting something. And there are some things you can do. My friend Job spent a tremendous amount of time helping me going around and centering all of the fibers and the wires on the studs so that they, were, they weren't close to either drywall surface. Um, and in cases when going through studs, if they were you know, within an inch of the surface, putting on nail plates and things like that. So things you can do in the physical layout of how you pull the wire to make it less likely they get damaged uh, during the later part of construction. Uh, so far, I haven't had any fiber that was damaged during the later parts of construction, so that, that plan worked out well. I think a second consideration was is how much and what kind of fiber to run. And an overall theme of the wire pulling was it's much cheaper to pull wire when the house is being built than it is to do later. And that's that can be true in many different ways. And in, in this house in particular, uh, there's a great deal of steel beams in the construction that are very difficult to get wire either through or around, um, especially after it was built. And so it, the cost differential there for doing it while it's being built is really much, much higher. And so the overall strategy was, if in doubt, pull more wire because the cost of the wire is very minimal compared to everything else. Um, and so as an example, on all of the CAT6 and CAT6A drops, there's not a single drop in the house that is a single drop. There are always two wires in that drop at a time uh, at sort of a minimum. And so we did a lot of effort to make sure that there was plenty of wire in plenty of different places. Um, on the fiber side, other than the interconnections between the wiring closets, I did pull a single mode fiber to each of the AP locations um, that may not be necessary right now, but eventually um, with 60 gigahertz wireless and some of the even higher frequency wireless going above 10 gigabit transfer rates, then it's worthwhile to future proof um, by pulling fiber. And in the case of like single mode, the single mode zipline fiber is incredibly inexpensive. So there's really no reason not to pull that when you're pulling um, normal CAT6 or CAT6A. In fact, overall, the cost of pulling fiber is relatively inexpensive um, compared to the time and effort it takes to drill all the holes and make all the paths for the regular CAT6 or CAT6A. Um, I did do some pulls where I pulled pre-terminated cables, and in some cases, not pre-terminated cables. And so we'll walk through that so you can see the differences. Uh, we'll start this by going upstairs to the upper front garage, which is where the demarcation location is, which is where wires come in from uh, the street. There are conduits that go out to the street. Uh, and that's sort of the starting point of the fiber subsystem. So this is my demarcation location, which is basically where uh, conduits come in from the street. And so when I had the conduits put in, I had the conduits put in, there's one there, one there, one there, and one there. And those are four conduits that are all low voltage conduits and uh, they basically go way down that way about a quarter mile to the street uh, and those kind of to put in just so I could use uh, for pulling low voltage of any kind and so the conduits come up and then every conduit has a panel box uh, that it terminates into and then from the panel box there are wires that go to 
different places and fiber. And in general, the concept was that I had these four here that represent the four conduits. And then this is sort of a, what you might call a fiber concentrator uh, spot. So I will pull those covers off real quick and we'll take a look at what's in them. And here we are with those covers removed. And so one conduit, this is the conduit that has a uh, cable coming in from Comcast from one of the conduits. Um, and all four of these like conduit termination boxes, they all have one single mode and one multi mode that goes to the little fiber concentrator box, if you will, um, along with some low voltage from both the server room and one of the intermediate closets. Um, and so the idea there is that it, depending on what the use case was, other than just having incoming internet, there could be other things that I wanna wire um, from the front gate area over to here. And so this gives me four different paths uh, for doing that. So I could also do two different paths for two fibers for redundancy for the connection from the outside world. As far as the fiber sort of concentration box, so all the fibers come over here from the other boxes, as well as uh, there's 24 single mode fibers, 12 from the server room, 12 from one of the closets, and also 12 uh, multi-mode fibers that do the same thing that split between the uh, one of the closets and the server room, and then a few other extra uh, single modes. Uh, an example is one of the single modes here goes into this little switch, and then this single mode is one that goes all the way down to the gate in one of those other conduits. Uh, and so the idea here was really to have as much flexibility. I didn't really know what I was gonna need, and so I wanted to make sure I had plenty of capacity coming from uh, the road into one location, and then from this location to kind of a couple different paths to other parts of the house. And I think if you're planning a build, it's nice to do these boxes above the conduits, um, to have the conduits installed in the, you know, in, in the concrete and then have them piped up into the boxes. Um, that just makes it a little bit easier to uh, pull wire. You can see there's some pull string here that goes down that conduit that goes all the way to the road. And so those are good, a good way to kind of be able to have multiple things coming from different sources. It could be a telephone line or a fiber line from a provider and have them neatly tucked away in the wall. And so next we'll go take a look at uh, the two different intermediate closets and then we'll head down to the server room. So this is one of the mid-span closets where I have a small rack in here. Uh, a lot of the wiring from the upper part of the house terminates in here because this is a lot closer than going all the way to the server room. Um, and this room has an uh, uh, Unify XG16, um, which is SFP Plus, so 10 gig um, for a bunch of fiber interconnects. There's a single mode that comes from the server room plus one going to an AV closet and then a backup path through two multi modes to one of the other closets, which has another path downstairs. So this is sort of double pathed uh, back to the server room. Um, and then there's also you know, a bunch of extra fiber that I ran to this location, um, which includes so 12 single modes and 24 or 12 single modes and 12 multi modes that go to the demarcation. And then there are 12 and 12 that go to the server room directly, plus a few other locations. Um, and this is all unterminated fiber. And then I also did run some pre-terminated fiber when I did this, just so it was easy to plug in when I first moved in. And so this is an, an, a pre-terminated single mode. Um, which I'm using right now, which worked perfectly. So it was a good idea to do that just to make it easier to get things up and running. And I do have a, a Microtik switch I just installed, which has QSFP plus ports, because I'm gonna do a 40 gig single mode link to the server room, and then another 40 gig link over to my uh, office chair, which is, uh, yeah, big Kirby monitor, which is good for writing code. And so let's walk over and take a look at the uh, other intermediate closet. So this is another intermediate closet. Uh, as with the other one, it has a single mode drop from the server room and a pair of multi-modes that make its way over to the other closet, uh, along with just a bunch of extra uh, drops that ended up terminating here that I haven't used yet. And so this is just another mid-span point where I can put in more gear um, and also to have a second path between uh, the other distribution closet and the server room. So here we are in the server room. Turn off the lights there. And so down here we have a sort of a core aggregation switch. These are all 10 gig SFP plus ports plus the 25 gig ones on the end there. Um, and these connect over to the server rack behind me. So a couple 40 gig connections and then some, some 20 gig connections. 
Um, and then these single mode ones go to the different closet locations that we looked at earlier, plus one up to the uh, front gate. Uh, UDM Pro, of course, for the firewall connected to that. Uh, the internet stuff comes in right here, and it's 2.5 gig um, internet connection. And then there's also a backup here. There's a Starlink, which is installed upstairs, uh, that goes into the backup port on the UDM Pro, uh, which actually works really well, because if the incoming internet connection from Comcast fails, which it has before because it's on poles along the street, so if there's a tree that hits it, it'll take it down, uh, the Starlink kicks in and it's entirely seamless. Other than maybe noticing a slight difference in speed, uh, you wouldn't even know that the internet had changed over. And so uh, when I pulled to this location, I have all these fibers here, and many of these I pulled as pre-terminated fibers, so they were easy to do. And then I also have a bunch of fibers coming in these tubes here uh, that go to a spool of unterminated fiber. Uh, the idea being that I can then splice, especially those 12 and 24 uh, junction ones, uh, those are not terminated yet, but I have them set up for termination. I did put in a little, some little splice trays here, and so all the ones from other locations come into these trays here. Um, and these are a nice way to have the uh, fiber come in the back and then have connections from the front. And so kind of an easy way to do it. And uh, that's pretty much all of the fiber interconnectivity. So we will wrap this video up. So a great question is, what would I do differently? What went sort of well and not well? I think overall, I wouldn't change very much. I ran a great deal of fiber to different locations and I have yet to have a fiber that failed or was damaged during other parts of the build. So that's, I think, a good thing um, and a good show of the practice of being careful about the routing. And I was ex exceptionally careful about thinking about what could happen to a given uh, fiber or wire where it was laying during the rest of the build process. And so if you do that, uh, I think you can probably mitigate the likelihood of having a failure of some kind. Um, as far as if I would run anything differently, I think there are a few small things. I probably didn't quite interpret what I was going to do in this area, especially. And I have a Mac Studio right over there that I use for some of the video editing stuff. And it has a 10 gig connection, but I wish I had ran a fiber over there for a 40 gig connection eventually. Um, so there are a couple things like that. I probably would have ran a few more fibers uh, into some spots in the garage here. Um, so some minor things like that. Uh, the wiring for all of the AP coverage has worked really well. I ran uh, both a Cat 6, actually two Cat 6As and a fiber for an access point in every single room in the house. And so there's nowhere in the house that doesn't have line of sight to an AP location. I didn't, I haven't used all those locations because with 2.4 gig, 5 gig, and 6 gig, uh, you don't necessarily have to have line of sight for those to work and they probably get through walls pretty well. Um, eventually with 60 gigahertz though, that is relatively line of sight restricted. And so for that, I think having access point possibilities in every room is a good thing. Uh, but there really, really isn't much else I would change. I'm glad that I did as much as I did. And you know, the fiber itself is relatively inexpensive. And when I was putting in the fiber, you know, I had a couple thousand foot spools of the, of the 12 and 24 uh, single mode fiber uh, packs. And so like for those, once I got done, if I still had 400 feet, I just ran 400 feet more somewhere uh, because I wasn't going to use the fiber anywhere else. Uh, and it's always better to have more than less, especially in case of a failure. So I'm glad that worked out well. And I encourage you that if you're going to hire a low voltage contractor or you're going to build your house, one is I encourage you to try to do it yourself or at least be involved in it. It really is a good experience. Um, but if you are going to hire someone, try to figure out how that works in terms of fiber. And if they have any experience in running a fiber, I think the one danger is that with fiber, you do have to route it somewhat carefully and you don't want to use like zip ties that squeeze the fiber or bend it on, on, on tight radius. And there is some fiber you can buy. There's a couple of really good corning fibers that have a tighter bend radius, but still it's it's easy to overbend them because they're so small. And so if you're gonna have someone install them, it's helpful if they're aware of those things and can, yeah, can install them in a way that doesn't get damaged. Because it'd be terrible to have all that fiber installed only to have it not work because it has a, a kink somewhere. Um, but that's sort of how I did the fiber. And so, I'll do another video coming up here on um, fiber splicing, where we're going to take one of those 12 fiber pairs uh, in the closet upstairs, and we're going to uh, use a fusion splicer and terminate it 
uh, into a splice can and uh, get it set up with a couple 40 gig connections. So that should be coming up soon.